Wall Street corrects for the third straight session with tech stocks being the worst hit. Indices, however, remain on track to close five consecutive months of gains. Stocks in the Asia-Pacific are mixed following a weak handover from Wall Street. The GIF Nifty, meanwhile, is suggesting a muted start for the Indian market. Crude prices give up some ground as investors assess the impact of wars in Eastern Europe and West Asia. Brent crude trades around $86 a barrel. And India's current account deficit narrows to just over $10 billion between October to December last year. Merchandise trade deficit expands marginally to just over $71 billion in the same period. Good morning. Midweek is here and you're watching Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18 in the Mumbai newsroom. I am Hormus Fatakia. Let's first take a look at how the Asian markets are faring this morning. Most of the indices on last check were trading with modest gains. It's a mixed picture as we speak. The Taiwanese index is up just 0.1%, but the Hang Seng is down over a percent this morning. And the South Korean Kospi, which led the gains in the Asian markets yesterday, is also trading with losses. And if you take a look at the GIF Nifty as well, that is pointing to a slightly muted start for our markets. Now, 35 points lower, the implied open. It was a weak session, mind you, for the Nifty yesterday, but the broader markets did well. So we'll keep an eye out on the GIF Nifty as well. But the handover from Wall Street was a weak handover there because the benchmark indices ended Tuesday's trading session lower with the Dow Jones ending flat. If you can see the picture there, it looks flat. The indices were trading positive for most parts of the trading day because the tech-heavy Nasdaq composite settled with losses of about 69 points when all three indices sold off in the final 30 minutes of the trading session. CNBC's Kate Rogers gets us a wrap of all the action on Wall Street. U.S. markets finished down across the major indices as Wall Street failed to reignite the rally that brought all-time highs to the Dow, S&P and Nasdaq recently. The Dow lost 31 points, the S&P 500 was down 15, the tech-heavy Nasdaq dropped by 69. Amazon is now offering same-day deliveries of medications in New York City and in Los Angeles. The service began today and Amazon says it's using new, smaller facilities stocked with the most common prescriptions. Amazon says the service will expand to more than a dozen cities by the end of the year. Former President Trump's social media company made its Wall Street debut today. The Truth Social parent company, which merged with a shell corporation in order to go public, hit the stock market under the ticker symbol DJT, the same ticker he used almost 30 years ago when his hotel and casino company went public. Just minutes into trading, shares surged over 50 percent, triggering a brief trading halt due to volatility. Shares finished the day up 16 percent. That's what's happening here in the U.S. Back to you in Mumbai. Kate Rogers there with the action on Wall Street. Now let's listen to some important opinion coming in from experts on the market setup in the US and the Fed rates policy going ahead and the impact on its equities and more. When you look at equities through the prism of the rate cuts that they're likely pricing in, um, as well as many other metrics, they definitely seem to be running quite frothy. Um, and in fact, I think the Fed is really allowing this by essentially letting the market and the economy live in a 3% inflation world, you know, higher than that, really, while talking about getting to target and talking about rates. But really, if I'm Jerome Powell, what is the impetus for me to do anything right now? What's most likely is the market's flat. From here to the end of the year, 5,200. That's target. It's expectation that you have modest growth in earnings, about 8%, looking into this year and 5% into or 6% into calendar 2025. That's the trajectory of profits. It was when the market was pricing, you know, three cuts was priced into the market sort of last uh, fall, and then it kind of moved all the way to six cuts, again, forward market pricing. The smaller cap stocks rallied dramatically. And that's this idea of the equal weighted index, if you will, having a catch up. So to the extent that there is more cuts than is currently expected right now, that would be a positive for a broadening of the market. To the extent that there are fewer cuts, Goldman Sachs economists expect three, forward market pricing roughly around that level. If it was two, then that would be more supportive of larger cap, better balance sheets, more, you know, the, the mega cap stocks continue to do better. I, I still think the momentum is there. I, I, I still think this bull move is strong and has a ways to go. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, you could have a little corrections under the way, kind of head fakes. But, uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think the news is strong. I, I think the inflation is going to be uh, being reduced. Uh, I saw a GDP estimate uh, by uh, the Atlantic Fed just came out after the durable goods at 2.1 percent, exactly the target of the Fed this year. Um, so the economy is not showing signs of weakness. And surprisingly, a uh, 12 month earnings forward, instead of usually they, they, they go down as the year goes uh, on because they're often over estimistic, are actually rising in many circumstances. So I still think, yes, we could have a two, even a 5 percent reaction. But I don't think this uh, this bull market is over. Don't think this bull market is over. That's the bigger takeaway there from the US market action overnight. But how will all of this impact our markets this morning? We have our power prep segment and our research team is joining in to tell us about the trade setup and the stocks to watch out for in today's session. First up, Ekta is joining in to get us all the cues that we need to watch out for today. Morning, Ekta. It was a weekday for the Nifty, but the broader markets did well. What are you picking up for this morning? Well, morning, Hormuz. Uh, yesterday, in fact, yes, uh, the Nifty did snap a three-day uh, rally. We had the mid-caps which outperformed the frontliners. The advanced decline ratio, however, was negative yesterday. So the U.S. markets, you've been talking about them. Yes, the U.S. markets did close mixed in yesterday's trading session, largely lower in yesterday's trading session. Asia is largely mixed at this point in time. And we have oil, which is still on the boil, around $86 per barrel. The Ukraine drone strikes as well as the Red, Christ, uh, Red Sea crisis has caused some amount of disruptions. The gift nifty indicating a little bit of a softer start as we speak. Well, one of the key cues is also the current account deficit, which has come in at around $10 billion for the entire Q3. The trade deficit, however, uh, was still wide at around 71. Uh, now, just uh, in the overall picture, the markets are likely to consolidate in what is a holiday shortened week. News flow is probably going to be slower due to one, a truncated week and two, because Q4 as now is now coming to an end. So the markets are probably preparing or companies are preparing for earnings season. The Nifty range, according to experts, is 21,850 to 22,200. So maybe we could probably be within that range unless there is a breakout. Now watch for the mid caps outperforming because that's what we saw yesterday. The advanced decline ratio probably seeing some amount of improvement or sustaining at those levels. So that would be an important monitorable and the Nifty holding on to 22,000 levels. In terms of queues, we have the March expiry on Thursday. We've been talking about the inflation data which will be out for the US or the personal consumption data which will be out on Friday for the US which will be an important monitorable. And the Fed chair will be speaking at the San Francisco Central Bank branch on Friday as well. Remember, markets are closed, but nonetheless, all of these queues will be important come Monday. All right, plenty of queues to track and 22,000 is the level to watch out for on the Nifty this morning. Thanks a lot, Ekta, for joining in. Now over to Upasna, who would list out the stocks to watch out for in today's trading session. Upasna, good morning. Good morning. First up, a Siplant Sanofi will be in focus today as Sipla signs exclusive partnership with Sanofi for distribution of Sanofi India's CNS product range in India. Uh, additionally, also Sipla gets a regulatory approval to merge Sipla's Tech LLC into Sipla USA Inc. And the merger will be uh, effective from 1st of April 2024. Next up is LIC. The company gets GST demand order worth 16 crores. That's the reason even this stock will be in focus today. Angel One, next up, launches QIP issue. Floor price is set at 2,555, which is at a discount of almost 7% to the yesterday's closing price on NSE. And mind you that the board meeting will be held on 2nd of April to determine the issue price. Next up is Sham Metallics, Natural Resources Energy Private Limited, obtains letter of intent for the grant of composite license for Surja Gad iron ore block for an area of almost which is about 1526 hectares. Next up is Technocraft industry that will also be in focus today as the uh, company's unit will commence its production in a phased manner with effect from 27th of March 2024. Next up is Uflex. Pradeep Srivastava, the erstwhile director of the company's wholly owned subsidiary of United Kingdom, that is Uflex Europe, is found to have committed fraud. Next up is Pratak Snacks, the commencement of commercial production at new unit of the company's uh, unit situated in JNK with the effect of 26th of March 
2024. That's the reason even this stock will remain in focus today. Plenty of stocks to watch in today's session. Thanks a lot to Pasna. And aside of all of these names, there are two very important names to track. CDSL and Astra DM. Both of them will see a block deal taking place in today's trading session. And finally, Nigel is joining in with cues from the FNO space. Morning, Nigel. 20 DMA, 50 DMA. That's where the Nifty has confined itself to, I guess. Well, that's right, Hormuz. You know, it's, we are seeing lackluster volumes, actually. And in terms of the Nifty yesterday as well, we did end lower, but I don't think there's any big reason to worry. What do the FIs do? Well, they are unbound positions, both in the long as well as on the short side. So if you look at it, the longs came down by close to around 8,000 contracts, while the shorts came down by around 5,000 contracts. They remain net short with close to around 67% of their positions on the short side. And also, if you look at it in absolute terms, it's around 70,000 contracts. That's the absolute number you should be looking at. But the reason that I say there's no big reason to worry is because I believe that the Nifty has strong support added on this 21,700 to around 21,900 dot mark. That's because there's the highest open interest added on the 22,000 put. It continues to see writing. The open interest out there is more than uh, one crore odd. And yesterday as well, you did see that the premium was hovering around that 60 rupee odd mark. And if you look at the writing that we've seen at that strike, it perfectly ties in with yesterday's low as well as the 50 DMA, which comes in at around 21,948. You know, that level should come up for you on the screen. And the recent low was 21,710. And uh, the options data suggests that 21,900 mark, that's going to be the crucial support zone. On the Nifty Bank, well, that plays out the weekly expiry today. And the 20 DMA, that remains elusive. We have tried to get to that 47,000 odd mark, but not able to conquer that. On the downside, the 20 DMA is going to be crucial, which is a few hundred points away from here. And in the near term, you'll want to look at the 50 DMA. So on your screen, the crucial levels on the Nifty Bank. But, you know, we're looking at a number of stocks that are going into the FNO ban. At one point of time, it was quite high. But as of now, only sales left in the FNO ban because there was some fair bit of unwinding of positions on Z, Biocon, as well as Tata Chemical. So all these stocks will be coming out of the FNO ban. Keep an eye out on them for today's session. Back to you, Hormuz. Thanks a lot, Nigel. Interesting stocks that are out of the FNO band today. We'll keep an eye out on all of these names. Time for a short break now, but when we return, leading medical devices manufacturer Wipro GE Healthcare plans to invest 8,000 crore rupees in India over the next five years. More on that on the other side. Welcome back to Power Breakfast on CNBC TV 18. On to some macro data now. India's current account deficit narrowed to $10.5 billion for the period of October to December, according to the RBI data. The current account deficit for the period stood at 1.2% of India's GDP. The merchandise trade deficit, though, at $72 billion, was marginally higher on a year-on-year -year basis. However, services exports grew by 5.2% year-on-year due to rising outbound shipments of software, businesses and travel services. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive now. Leading medical devices manufacturer Wipro GE Healthcare plans to invest 8,000 crore rupees in India over the next five years. GE Healthcare's president and global CEO Peter Arduini told CNBC TV 18 Shireen Bhan that he expects India to be among the top three markets for the company. He added that the making in India for the world will be a big part of the company's growth strategy. Here's a slice of that conversation. For GE Healthcare and GE Wipro, really a confidence vote about how we see the future of not only India, but the India capabilities for the rest of the world. And, and as you mentioned, uh, the you know, roughly $1 billion of investment over the next five years, to put that in perspective, um, we invested about probably around $4 billion over the last 30. And so not only is it an acceleration, it's a, a significant step up from where we were before, but it will go into manufacturing capabilities. Um, R&D, I think you, you're well aware of, of much of the software work that we've done here, particularly in Bangalore over the years, but how that advances more into artificial intelligence. And what I'm also very excited about is the opportunity for the robustness of the supply chain, you know, level two, level three suppliers uh, growing, and which will enable us to build a, a more robust med tech sector here. Don't give a region-wise breakup, but you know, just uh, uh, the aspirational target as far as what you believe the size of the India business could be over the next five years. I think it's going to be one of our top three biggest opportunities really around the globe to continue to expand. Um, it's again, uh, I would place it there that says 
it will merit more and more of my time and focus, um, not only on how we can actually, you know, make in India for the world, but the Indian market and then its growth potential and what it can mean to a company like GE Healthcare. Exclusive conversation there with Wipro GE Healthcare's president and global CEO. Let's slip into a short break. Up next, we get you cues from the commodities market. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Power Breakfast here on CNBC TV 18. Let's now get to all the action from the commodity space. Manisha Gupta is joining in. Good morning, Manisha. What are you picking up from all that is happening overnight? Well, uh, there's a lot of movement across commodities and uh, rightly so because one, this is a truncated week and uh, the markets also will watch out for the U.S. inflation data. And before we hit the end of the week, it also is going to be about the Fed official statements, including Jeremy Powell himself. So we have seen a bit of a strength come in for the dollar index and that seems to be weighing on commodities. Uh, the crude oil prices also have slipped as the U.S. inventories have increased. The markets also are looking at the Red Sea. While there are concerns there, but the overall buildup of crude on international waters now stands at 100 million barrels. So that tells you that there is enough and more crude there unless it continues to stay there. Of course, there's a delay of reaching it in the terms of destinations. There also is a report from Macquarie saying that they expect the Brent at $90 by the month of June. So near-term choppiness, yes, but by the second quarter, there is more strength that the street is anticipating. The gold, cri- the gold prices in the meanwhile also have climbed ahead of the U.S. inflation data. There's an expectation that you there is a Fed rate cut in June happening at a 71% probability. Also, there is strong physical demand from China. The central banks have continued to buying. The global gold ETFs also have seen a lot of inflow coming in, and that in turn also has been supported. Interesting. Thanks a lot, Manisha, for joining in, getting us all the updates from the commodity space. Moving on now, let's get you excerpts from our conversation with Consumer Affairs Secretary Rohit Kumar Singh, who spoke to CNBC TV 18's Tim Jaipuria and discussed the inflation and the outlook on inflation as well as the prices of onions and the interest of farmers in great detail. Let's listen in. Inflation is something to watch. And uh, globally, food inflation has been a matter of concern. But I can say with a lot of sincerity that uh, India has been able to manage its food inflation really well when it compares to other geographies. So I think it starts with uh, very proactive monitoring and then taking policy decisions quickly. I think in commodities, timing is the key. And our governance framework from the interministerial committee of secretaries to the committee of secretaries headed by the cabinet secretary to the group of ministers headed by honorable home ministers. We have to support the farmer. The other is we have to uh, make sure that the consumer is able to get goods both in an affordable way and they have to be available. I don't think farmers are unhappy. It is a segment of the trade which was, you know, the prices in India, FOB were like $340. But in overseas markets like Bangladesh, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, they were at about a thousand dollars. So a segment of the trade obviously wanted to make that killing, which we have prevented because for us domestic supplies are very important because if you let the stuff go out, then the availability in the domestic market suffers. We have not let it go beyond 30, 35 rupees. Mm -hmm. So it is only possible because of the policy interventions like ban of export and other stuff, so that for the domestic consumers, the availability and affordability is ensured, which for any government, any benevolent government, is a top priority. The government has announced that we will be buying 5 lakh tons for the government buffer now. So it will start maybe in 15-20 days from now, when the moisture level of the onion which comes from the farm goes down, so it's dried up. So by ensuring that 5 lakh tons will be bought through NAPED and NCCF from the domestic farmer. It gives further comfort level to the farmer that any kind of crisis in terms of prices crashing will not happen. So I think these two efforts, uh, as I said in the first question, we have to balance the interest of the farmer as well as the consumer. And I think we have been able to do it successfully. 
Consumer Affairs Secretary Rohit Kumar Singh there in exclusive conversation with CNBC TV 18. On to some global updates now. A day after the United Nations Security Council resolution on the Israel-Hamas war was passed, fighting still continues between the two sides. Last evening, at least 12 Palestinians were killed in an air raid that hit a tent full of displaced people. The Israeli army also raided several homes in the West Bank city. Meanwhile, Israel has also recalled its negotiators from Doha after citing that the true stocks had reached a dead end due to the demands that Hamas had placed. And six workers are missing and presumed dead following a bridge collapse in the Baltimore harbour yesterday caused by a Singapore-flagged cargo vessel ramming into the structure. Officials say that chances of survival for the six workers are very low considering the frigid temperature and the time elapsed since the bridge collapse. The 22-member all-Indian crew of the ship, however, was rescued with no injuries being reported and active rescue operations were halted 18 hours after the tragedy. Ahead of the crash, the ship had reported a power failure which allowed officials to stop traffic on the bridge before the collapse, which otherwise could have resulted in additional casualties. And that's all we have on this edition of Power Breakfast. Bazaar Morning Call is up next to prep you for the market open. Thank you so much for watching.